Hello Year 5 and Year 6. Welcome back to English Lessons Live with me, Mr Phillips. It is Wednesday the 20th and it's time to crack on with a little bit more writing. Um, before we do though, get straight down into our spag starter. So we've got a, another prefix question we did there. Prefix, wait, do we do suffixes? I remember, what did we do last time? Yeah, we did prefixes. So carry on with that theme. What does the prefix multi mean in the words multicultural, multipurpose, and multicolored? What does the prefix multi mean? And your options are some, few, all, or many. So if you think about multicultural, you might say a town is multicultural or a school is multicultural. Um, you might say multipurpose, for example, you know, my, my key ring is multipurpose. And you might say multicolored. That coat is multicolored. What does multi mean when you put it in front of the root word? Some, few, all, or many. Okay. Pause the video there, and then see if you. Well, just all you need to do is write down the prefix. Write down the prefix that you think is what multi means. Okay. So, and I hope it's a nice, easy one, but multicultural means there's lots of different cultures in a place. So if a school is a multicultural place, it means there's lots of cultures, lots of people from different cultures in that place. Multipurpose means it has lots of purposes, um, and multicolored means it has lots of colours. Now, obviously, lots of is not in that option, but it's not some, it's not few, it's not all, because, you know, multicolored is not every single colour. It is many, many cultures many purposes, many colours, yeah? So multi means many, yeah? If you've got that, well done. It's always it's always worth, you know, finding the root word and then having, you know, many, many cultures doesn't work, but, you know, cultures is the noun, is the noun version. So, you know, you can always practice it like that, you know, many cultures, many purposes, many colours, yeah? That's always the best way to have a little look at prefixes. So, Moving on to our writing today, we're carrying on with the same thing. So actually, I'm going to go up and we're going to carry on with our writing from yesterday. Not yesterday, Monday. We are generating character descriptions to use in the opening of a spy story. And I know I struggled um, on Monday to create some sentences, but we came up with some really good stuff in the end. Um, and some of the stuff you guys have been sending in is absolutely amazing. Well done. It's, it's brilliant descriptions. Um, a lot of original ideas as well, which is great. Um, last time we didn't get up to doing the criminal, so that's what we're going to do today. We only managed to get um, the spy lady done. Do we have a quick recap of the writing we did last time? We've tried to use a variety of these lenses, make sure all of the um, structures are different, and also try to make sure we did multiple sentences for each unit of description. Yeah, all of those things are what we've tried to do today or on Monday to make the writing really good. And that's what we're doing the same thing today. So what we wrote last time for the Lady Spy is shielding her dazzling green eyes was a short rimmed blue suede hat, which was pulled down low over her face to mask her identity from any onlookers. There was a dark leather band wrapped around the base. An MI5 logo had been carefully carved into it. Gloriously golden hair cascaded down her back, held in a tight ponytail by a metallic ring. To an unknowing civilian, it would appear to be a simple piece of jewellery, but in reality, it was a high-tech tracking device. That does actually need to be in commas, but in reality, because in reality is a parenthesis, hung from her ear and hidden extremely discreetly, a flesh-coloured microphone buzzed and crackled. It contained the most expensive equipment MI5 had, but was as small as the head of a pin. There we go, so that is our... All of our writing for our spy, and today we're going to do the villain, this criminal here. Now, last time we already made some notes. We want to talk about the, the nose, the body, and the quip. We want to speak to about like, the long nose. We want to speak uh, speak about the thin body, and we want to speak about that Mr. Phillips quiff that is sticking out um, underneath his hat. So, should we get right into it? One of the difficult things about carrying the writing directly under this is that the entire time you'll be looking back at that piece of writing from yeah, uh, Monday and 
comparing it and making sure I'm not doing the same kind of structures, which is harder for writing, but generally, you know, it's what I should be doing to make sure that I'm really varying it. So, nose, first of all, I want to talk about how, you know, it reaches out. I want to avoid any really childish descriptions because I've not really here done any kind of silly childish descriptions. So I don't want to be saying, here's a nose like Pinocchio, because that's not quite the right tone that I've set. I've set a bit more of a serious tone. Um, I think a word I've been using quite a lot in year three and year four's writing, because they've been speaking about wolves, is protruding. So I might get the word protruding in there. Um, I might liken it to, you know, um, I might, might, let's say it's sharp, like a knife or something like that. Um, okay. I might have a little bit of comedy. Maybe it appears around the corner before it, it, any other part of his body does. <laughs> so, what? How am I going to start this one? Um, possibly, I might start with protruding, protruding from his face. Not going to refer to, but just protruding out. The reason again, I'm not using from his face. It's because as soon as I tell the audience his nose, they don't need to know it's coming from his face. They're going to know it's coming from his face. So I'm going to try and really cut down on that unnecessary detail part. Protruding out was um, um, protruding out like I feel like a um, a similar good work here. Protruding out um, sharp like knife. A hooked, crooked um, nose. Hmm. Feels a bit simplistic, doesn't it? But it's a good starting point, and I can start building onto it. Protruding out, sharp like a knife, with a hooked, crooked nose. Um. Maybe I can add a, a support, a subordinate conjunction, and talk about this idea of it arrives. Um, around the corner before he does. Um, when hiding behind a corner, his protruding, no, his hooked crooked nose protruded out, um, revealing his um, location to any lo revealing his location and I don't think the sharp like a knife bit works at the moment. When hiding behind a corner his crooked his hooked crooked nose protruded out revealing his location. So maybe I can put this as embedded parenthesis. Crooked nose sharp like a knife protruded out Revealing his location. That's better, isn't it? That, that kind of sits together a little bit nicer. When hiding behind a corner, his hooked crooked nose, sharp like a knife, protruded out, revealing his location. Because there, we've got loads of different clauses. We've got a front adverbial there. We've got a, um, a non-finite clause there. And we've got a bit of parenthesis there. Because the main clause is his hooked crooked nose protruded out. And then we've added all these little bits onto the end. I think that's pretty good. Um, when hiding behind a corner, his hooked, crooked nose, sharp like a knife, protruded out, revealing his location. Now I need another sentence about his nose. Um, what could we say? Maybe um, from his years of being a criminal, it was kind of scarred and a bit, uh, a bit mushed up from being in so many rough encounters. I feel like I might want to add that into it. Um, or maybe it provides him with a unique sense of smell. Um, oh yeah, so despite, because that's a good um, conjunction that I don't get to use all the time. So despite is good for saying, you yeah, know, this is true, but despite that, this can still happen. You know, it's like a nice even though alternative. Um, despite this, um, the cunning master criminal. Um, oh, despite this obvious, and it's kind of like um, almost like it. No, it's not a mistake. It's like what 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 was weakness. Um, 
Hmm. I'll put a fault in for now and I'll come back and change that. I'll underline it to remember what it's part of this office fault. Um, the cunning master criminals. Um, no, oh, I don't want to say no again. Well, um, is um, blessed with a unique sense of smell. Colon, and then I'm going to describe it because remember from last time, um, colon separates two main clauses that make sense by themselves, and the second one describes what you've just, or explains what you've just said. So despite this obvious fault, the cunning master criminal is um, luckily, um, luckily blessed with a unique sense of smell. Um, da -da 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 -da. Oh, actually, I don't need a colon here. I'm going to save colon for later on. I'm going to put that down there to, remember to use it, because I think I can use a relative clause quite well here. Um, um, which has um, saved him from many um, potentially fatal scrapes in the past. Or we use scrapes to describe like near misses or, or situations where it's nearly turned bad. When hiding behind a corner, his hooked, crooked nose, sharp like a knife, protruded out, um, revealing his location. Despite this obvious um, fault, the cunning master criminal is luckily blessed with a unique sense of smell, which has served him from many potential uh, saved him from many potential fatal scrapes in the past. Um, I feel like I still need to describe what the, the sense of smell is. Um, should um, a should a should an officer of the law be within um, a 10 meter radius there and maybe I could describe that odor as being like um, really awful for the criminal um, because they're so good they're righteous um, pious the so righteous and pious means people who think they're above everyone else because they're in charge they're righteous pious pong pious pong um, um, would alert the thief to um, to their presence and presence is in being there, uh, being there. That's nice. That's very Roald Dahl, pious pong. <laughs> when hiding behind a corner, his hooked, crooked, crooked nose, sharp like a knife, protruded out, revealing his location. Despite this obvious fault, the cunning master criminal is look was luckily um is nothing. I'm going to past tense. Despite this obvious fault, the cunning master criminal was luckily blessed with a unique sense of smell, which has say which again I've changed the tense, which say um had saved him from many potentially fatal scrapes in the past. Should an officer of the law be within a ten meter radius, their righteous pious pong would alert the thief to their presence. That's great, because it's not only does it do loads of description, but it, it kind of starts building a bit of the story world around us. So this is a, you know, a, a criminal who can smell out um, police officers before they even arrive. I really like that. I just want a different word for fault. Despite this obvious shortcoming, that's, I think that's what I wanted, shortcoming. A shortcoming is kind of like, um, you know, if he has shortcomings, he has things that's wrong with him, things that make him fall short of the expected standard kind of thing. Yeah, I really like that. So we've done his nose, and now it's time to talk about his body. And we know we want to try and get a colon in because we've not used that yet. Um, I'm going to do a type of sentence that Alan Pete often teaches. Um, and normally I don't like it in a narrative unless it's placed really well. I think generally it describes location better than it describes character. So I think for this slightly exaggerated cartoony kind of character, it might be okay. So um, um, I'm gonna describe his body as slim and nimble. Slim and nimble. So it's starting off with description words. Slim and nimble, the crafty, 
crook. And you notice how I kind of like try to come up with lots of different words for thief. I've called him the cunning master criminal and the, the thief. Um, and now the crafty crook. I just try and vary those noun phrases that I'm using to describe him. Slim and nimble, the crafty crook. Um, do I need to kind of, I could use the phrase somewhat resembled. Like, a, you know, he's so thin. Um, yeah. Slim and nimble, the crafty crook. Um, somewhat resembled a I don't want to be too positive so maybe like a like an un, like an unhealthy tree or something like the stripped bear um maybe a, maybe a snake I'm trying to think of things that are negative and thin mm. and then if we think about what we learn in the Anthony Brown the zoo project we need to try and keep our figurative language Figurative language threads um, slightly on context. So trees, snakes, neither of them fully link to what we're doing. Um, I mean, if you try to think about the wider realistic world that this story would be set in, maybe. Maybe it's maybe just more like a, a mundane household object, like a wire hanger. Slim and nimble, the crafty crook somewhat resembled a um, a thin metal wire. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Slim, I tell you what, I'll come back to the, what it looks like, and I'll do, because I'm trying to do one of these in a moment, I'll do a movement, an action one. Slim and nimble, the crafty crook. Um, the crafty crook, crook could um, sneak through any given space in order to make his escape. There we go. And then I can explain with a colon why. Um, slim and nimble, the crafty crook could sneak through any given space in order to make his escape. Um, uh, the, the. Almost, almost like a. Ooh. I'm back on that point again. What could we describe him as? Almost as thin. Almost um, as thin um, as a. Actually, I'm not going to say almost as thin as a metal. As thin. As a metal pole. As a metal pole. Um, mm. You know what? I'm going to come out of that idea because I just I think all of these. What's wrong with that simile is that it's it's vague. You know, as thin as a metal pole. What's, how thin is a metal pole? You can have really thick metal poles. So it's not it's not a great simile. I'm kind of trying to bounce a few ideas off the page. I'm just not thinking that anything's really sticking at the moment. Um, I'm going to keep all my notes down here. I'm just not convinced I'm adding them in yet. Slim and nimble, the crafty crook could sneak through any given space in order to make his escape. Um, his unnaturally thin body. There you go, I've just given up with a simile now and just gone. Right, I'll just tell you literally what he's like. Um, his unnaturally thin body. Um, um, earned him the nickname Shadow. I'm going to put that in like a like single mark, speech mark. Um, naturally thin body earned him the nickname Shadow as he could disappear without, to disappear from any space without a trace. There you go, that's pretty good. Get rid of all these rubbish similes. And I managed to use a colon. Slim and nimble, the crafty crook could sneak through any given space in order to make his escape. His unnaturally thin body earned him the nickname Shadow as he could disappear from any space without a trace. Oh, I've already said space there. Um, he could, I was going to say he would disappear without a trace. He could disappear without a trace. Lovely. Um, 
Now, technically, that is one, well, technically, it's two sentences, but I've put a colon, so I've combined them together. Um, I'm just aware of time, so I might just quickly nip onto quip and see what I can get from there. Um, we found that body didn't really have that much, um, as much descriptive kind of material as I potentially thought. I could have gone on to his clothes, to be honest, but then, again, you run into the risk of just doing some really boring, dull uh, similes, you know, it's grey as metal, but it's just like, who cares, so what? Oh. Let's do his quiff now. Um, so from under, so straight away I can go straight with a, um, a prepositional phrase, from under his beanie hat, over his, under his trademark uh, beanie hat, um, a plume, so plume is a big kind of like, um, well normally we describe plume as like a plume of smoke or, you know, it might be a plume of feathers or something like that, it's like a, like a puff of or something. A plume of, um, a plume of aged grey hair. Um, now I would use protruded, but we've already used protruded, so, um, stuck out. Um, a from under his trademark beanie hat, a plume of aged grey hair stuck out in an untidy fringe. There we go. Of course, thinking how do I get the word fringe in there to make sure they know it's not just from everywhere. From under his trademark beanie hat, a plume of aged grey hair stuck out in an untidy fringe. Um, you can say like specks of dandruff. Specks of uh, dandruff. Um, were scattered throughout. Um, maybe because they fell from him like snow as <laughs> he ran. Um, falling from him like a light dusting of snow as he um, ran along the deserted streets. From under his trademark beanie hat, a plume of aged grey hair stuck out in an untidy fringe. Specks of dandruff were scattered throughout, falling from him like a light dusting of snow as he ran along the deserted street. I like that one. It's so weird isn't it? how some come really naturally and some just take forever to, uh, to construct. There we go. Right, so we have a little read of everything we've done for the crook today. When hiding behind a corner, his hooked, crook crooked nose, sharp like a knife, protruded out, revealing his location. Despite this obvious shortcoming, the cunning master criminal was luckily blessed with a unique sense of smell, which had saved him from many potentially fatal scrapes in the past. Should an officer of the law be within a ten metre radius, their righteous, pious pong would alert the thief to their presence. Slim and nimble, the crafty crook. Missing why the crafty crook could sneak through any given space in order to make his escape. His unnaturally thin body earned him the nickname Shadow, as he could disappear without a trace. From under his trademark beanie hat, a plume of aged grey hair stuck out in an untidy fringe. Specks of dandruff were scattered throughout, falling from him like a light dusting of snow as he ran along the deserted streets. I think that's great. So now we've got two sets of character descriptions. I remember what I said on Monday is that these aren't going to be um, used whoops, Daisy, all together in paragraphs. We're going to start scattering these descriptions through an opening paragraph of our spy novel. So for next Monday, make sure that you've got um, a couple of sentences to describe the spy and a couple of sentences to describe the villain. And I'll see you guys tomorrow for our reading lesson. Bye, guys.